<laughs> if you're coming in, if you're coming in as a new hire, first yeah. time ever, right? What yeah. are if if you're if you are the employer trying to hire them? What's the? It doesn't even have to be top three, right? But what are the top three yeah. uh, things you're looking for from this guy with their girl with completely zero experience? Yep. Yeah. So do they have any signs? So education, if they're coming out of a college environment, the education is going to be key, you know, depending on the role. So do they have the educational background? If they're not coming out of that, do they have any other sign from a previous Mm. involvement? Could even be, you know, if they're brand new high school um, or just didn't finish up college, you know, any other organizations or anything else that they took part of that they could show signs of those skill sets could be nonprofits, could be some sort of commitment. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. So looking for that. The the other thing would be let's see so science education science skill set I think it would be the the ability to get a feel for that person for me personally the way that I would go about it outside of just the conversation with them because they're an unknown quantity at that point so if they don't yeah. show the education side if I can't find out through other things I might have been involved in who else is around them that I might be able to talk to references yes but is there anybody else that's around them that I can talk to to get a feel for who this person is. That's that's pretty important. I'm not sure that a lot of companies or recruiters will take that much time on that. They're probably trying to move things a lot faster, though. Yeah. Eric, tell us a little bit. I know this can be a complete pivot here, but tell us a little bit about how Miss Jordan Roberts reached out to Walker and I about joining <laughs> y'all's mastermind group. What is so... We wanted to attend, but we were not able to because of the time during the work. But tell us a little bit about that. How's that going? And what are you hoping? What are your plans for that? Yeah. Yeah. Jordan, Jordan is awesome. She is doing absolutely phenomenal with us. Um, so yeah, so we actually, we just sunsetted the mastermind group source subject. No, I'm joking. It's actually not a source subject. I'll tell you. So we, our approach internally for journey, we're all for experimentation. So mm-hmm. uh, our goal is to continue to grow and develop the business, but also internally to make sure we're, we're individual on a path for growth and development as well. So when we see that there might be an opportunity for Jordan, as an example, to help us continue to grow and develop the business, but also something new that she can try out that she hasn't done before too. She's going to get my support, Mark's support behind what she's doing to try to help her go ahead and get something like that launched. The challenge we found is a lot of the people like you, like the two of you that we're interacting with, they have a day job. <laughs> so our biggest challenge, our number one challenge is just aligning how schedules would work for a group like that. Yeah. And there there were, you know, for, for the people that were able to engage and interact through that process, selfishly, I think we got a lot out of it, or Journey got a lot, or Jordan even got a lot out of it. And hopefully we're able to contribute some along the way. But yeah, it was a, it was a timing thing. But that was really a, a good learning from an experiment standpoint. And I think Jordan, Jordan hopefully will admit this. If not, I'll put her on the spot if she, if she ends up listening to this. We like failure on stuff like that for us isn't failure. Like we mm. pick up pieces from it. We encourage, you know, the, the right step and we make sure we take, okay, whatever these pieces are that we learn, you know, how can we apply them on the next thing? And what we learned, you know, based off of some of the relationships that she's built and we've all built through LinkedIn is we need to be more sensitive to who's, who has the day job, who's, who's working, you know, the normal job and who doesn't. And then based off of what we might be shaping to come alongside people make sure that we're sensitive to that it was a good learning for us i love that because construction is a failure every day type of business yeah you can either (laughs) come in and admit that hey i messed up what are we going to do to help what can i do to use you guys to help me or how are we going to fix it or we can be the guys that just hide and wallow in and never learn from it right and the reason that i love construction if you can't tell i'm getting a little fired up about it is that man there's no other industry like it like I can completely come home. No, I'm going to mess something up. My wife's going to make fun of me. Oh, well, I messed up. It's nothing new. But it's, <laughs> it's a tremendous yep. life skill that you have to learn that failure yep. is okay, right? Yep. I, it took me, Eric, I can't tell you how long. It took me forever. I was just drilled in me that perfection was the standard growing up. And that was a lot of why I felt yep. like I was so timid at interviews. But learning that failure is okay, we got to learn from it. It's just how do we respond, right? Like you said, hopefully Ms. Jordan and Mr. Eric learn how to respond to that. And like like you said, you're already thinking about the next wave of being able to do that. So kudos to you guys. But even cooler to think that you're a business that's in it to make money and you're still saying failure is okay. Let's learn from it, right? Mm-hmm. And just being yeah. able to tell your people that, I think that's a tremendous point in, a, in of itself. Yeah, I mean, if Elon Musk can blow up rocket ships and that's okay, <laughs> then right. I think right. we can run some other test projects ourselves yeah, I think it's it's about calculated risk. 
So I remember I was coaching a guy years ago and he, he was assessed in an area of risk and it was definitely an area, it was a blind spot for him. And so I was coaching through some of that with them. Walker, I might even shared, you know, this story with you, but not about you, but with you in terms of some of the stuff we've interacted with. Yeah. And I asked the guy, I said, what's your relationship to risk? And he's like, I love risk. Yeah. And I said, but how do those decisions normally play out for you? He's like, oh, horrible. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, well, okay. It's not okay. a good relationship. So, yeah. yeah. So all to say is like, it, it, you know, the buzzword, you know, fail, fail fast. People talk about all that. Like failure, I, I think is good, but it's got to be calculated risk. Strategic failure. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, the, and the more we were mature and you know, hopefully, you know, company wise, construction wise, especially that the more people we have around us to provide that safety net or the more structure, you know, policy, you know, procedure, the things that, you know, some people will rise on, but are really there for our benefit if, if they're set up properly, they allow you to have those little failures or those strategic failures so that you can build on top of them or find what the right, what the right solution is. And I think that's the important part. It's not ignorant failure, but it's smart failure. And it's, it's, you're exactly right. You hit the nail on the head. And it's also, it applies to the, your manager as well, as well, right? If you're a good manager, you're going to put your people under you in positions to where if they do fail, it's not catastrophic and it's not going to hurt them or hurt their company. Right. But it's, it's not going to be massive, but you're going to give them positions of, of leadership that whether they do great or they fail and they learn, it's going to be okay. And it, it's, and it's, it's in my first job, right? I got a certain amount of money that I could spend and, for yeah. problems. Like I, I got, Hey, yeah. here's this amount. You can spend it no matter what. And you just tell me later, right? I won't be mad. Yeah. And that was really freeing for me to make decisions because I can say, oh, cool. Like if I need to make a decision right now, whether it's right or wrong, I can learn later if it's wrong. Right. But at the moment, like I'm, I am free indeed to go and make that decision and try to get this problem solved one way or another, whether through yeah. monetary gains or not. And by being a manager or a company who promotes that within and who, who promotes your employees to say, Hey, look, if you do mess this up, it's okay. Like we're, we'll be all right. If you say something wrong to the client, we can come back for it. Right. There's really nothing that you can do that's going to make this deal fall through. That's the position you want to be in as an employer and as an employee, because at the end of the day, you're just going to learn from it and you're going to get better because of it. And it takes so much stress off of you. Yeah. Yeah. I think you, so you bring up an interesting point in that I was thinking through, as you're saying that it really boils down to communication. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, and I know it sounds so simple, but I know all of us in different ways wrestle with it. I mean, it's, it's, but going through a problem or a challenge and when something escalates beyond, you know, what someone can solve on their own and being aware of what you can do on your own or not, right. and just being upfront, Davis, you hit on it earlier as well, but being upfront about that communication I would say for someone that's early career, newer coming in, getting a hold of that right away is going to be absolutely critical. Most most managers that I know, most business owners that I that I know, it's not the bad news that's the issue. It's actually not getting the bad news, or it's getting getting the bad news wow. later than it could have been received. <laughs> and I'd say that obviously, if you're dealing with owners, owners reps, I mean anybody else you know, on a project as well. I mean. The same thing. Granted, you you want to be able to bring a solution or next step, but honestly, sometimes if you're looking at the time gap, you got to be able to say, "Hey, I actually don't know the next step yet. Give me till tomorrow morning, or give me till right. whatever it is. I'm going to bring you back the next step." You just needed to be aware that this is happening right now. But that communication mm -hmm. piece is critical, and it's also good for risk mitigation too. If I can mm -hmm. trust that somebody that works for me or somebody that I work with is going to give me a free flow of information, communicate what's going on, give me status. I'm going to be more likely to trust the information that's coming out of them. I'm also going to be more likely to give them freedom to solve this problem. That's good. Yeah. yeah no, I was going to say, I, I love, I love, I really wanted to point out what you said of saying, Hey, I, I want you to know what's going on. I don't know the problem, the answer to it yet, but give me, give me a day and I'm going to come back to you with a few solutions. I think that's a major differentiator between a leader and a non-leader is because if you bring someone else your problems, it's just going to yeah. give them a problem. Yep. But if you if you bring them, say, hey, look, there is a problem. I will bring you solutions, but let me go and, and, and field these first, right? Or even just bring them solutions right away and saying, this is what I think we should do. 
and that might not be what you're supposed to do, but at least you, it showed that you thought about it and you put in some time and effort to try to solve it. Sorry, Davis, you can go ahead. I, no, you're, you're good. Yeah, you're good. I have one real life story that's on my job site. <laughs> and then two, I have something I talked about this on the live stream Walker. And so the first things first, we had issues on our job still, still, still do not really now, I guess we're finishing the job. So, but we had issues with eating. Okay. So Everybody knows about what happened during COVID. Manufacturers just got halted to what their production was before. So now they were expecting to still be able to crank out at the same level they weren't. So long story short, we were forecasting to get our, our switch gear way later than we thought. And so mm. I think we started reaching out. What After the first time we knew that, it was a, it was a year out. And we were still having monthly calls with Eaton talking about it. But I think around the the eight, the six to eight month range, we notified our owner and told them, Hey, this is what's going on. This is going to be the switch gear, main power to the building. That's the big issue. Okay. We just kept updating them every single month. And so whenever that time comes, they're willing to adjust based off of us being able to forecast and tell them, Hey, yeah. the switch gear is going to be late. Now, if we just sat on it and didn't tell them and then all right, it's next week and the Twitch crew doesn't show up and it was supposed to be here in January and it shows up in April, they're going to be pissed, right? They're not going to be happy yeah. about it. But yeah. since we were able to do that, and again, I'm not going to take any credit. This was all my superintendent and project manager. Kudos to them for doing that. <laughs> Second, we talked about this on, on the live stream. If, if nobody got to see it, I would challenge everybody to go check out the Decentralized Conference by Jesse Hernandez. Had a lot of great people. But one of the things I talked about was – this thing when it came to communication. Walker and I strive to be problem solver, people connectors. It's one of our podcast values. We want to be able to tell people, hey, if I cannot solve this problem to, for you, I am going to find the person that's going to solve it. And you, you're not going to quit at it. You're going to have to be relentless. You're going to have to pursue yeah. it. It's such easy advice to give someone in our position, the next generation that's coming in, because so many people will just come to you and ask questions because we're in a position of leadership because we work for the DC, right? But we don't know anything. We're just trying to learn like other people. And so yeah. you can tell them, ah, I don't know. And they just walk by like, all right, well, I'm not going back to this kid ever again, right? right? Yeah. Or you can say, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, but let me go find that for you. Oh, I don't know, but here's the mechanical engineer's number. Oh, I don't know, but I saw this RFI. It's just the RFI you're talking about, right? Be willing yeah. to go take those steps. And so- I don't really have a question. I just want to talk about that. What do you, what do you think off of that? No, I, you're, so let's say someone's, you know, newer and working within a business, there's a, there's a notable dis, dif, difference for the person that actually wants to step up and help solve problems. You know, another way to look at it, if you're solving problems that someone else on your team, whether you report to them or, you know, whether it's just in a higher level role, if you're solving problems for them, they're probably going to like you. So, yeah, I mean, it's, pr it's pretty simple. If you make someone's job easier, they're probably going to want to keep you around. And beyond all that, you know, they're probably going to want to see, see good things for you too. That's right. If, if you're just mediocre, I hate to say it, but if you're just mediocre and you know, you're just getting the job done, but you know, when you know problems escalate, you're not being a solution, then you can't expect to really progress much more than where you're at other than if positions just open up and they don't have anybody else to fill them. And on top of that, you're probably not going to be ready for it because you didn't learn how to solve the problems you need to solve for the position. <laughs> you know, we, we broached it and we kind of said it, right. But all these things just come down to, to leadership and it comes down to leadership of, of others and of yourself. And one thing that Davis and I talk about is in order to be a good leader for others, you have to be able to lead yourself first. Yep. And you have to be able to step up and make those habits and do those things that you don't want to do and lead your family and lead the people around you before you can go and have an impact at your company or with you know people you just met. So for for you, for someone maybe who is young, who's in the company, it just started, or for someone who maybe has been in the company for 10, 20 years, but they've never really done any leadership positions and they want to grow in it. What's the one piece of advice you would give to someone who is trying to develop their leadership skill, right? Because we aren't born leaders. It is a skill that you yep. you have to grow and cultivate. So how would you encourage them to, to grow that? Yeah, I think the, it's, a, it's a great question. If I was only to give one view of it, 
it's going to sound cheesy, but you just got to view leadership development as a process and not an event. So someone has to understand that it has to be continuous. That's the one piece. The next thing would be to be humble enough to say, this is where I'm at. So um, I often, one of the questions I'll ask, even established leaders on leadership teams on a scale of one to 10, how would you rate your leadership ability? And no surprise, most people are going to give me, you know, nines or tens when I ask that question. And it's kind of early on when I'm working with with some companies and teams. So there is a little bit of posturing and they're trying to figure out if I'm out to get them or if I'm really there to help them. These are some of the people, you know, most of them don't think that, but there are some of them. Yeah. Um, but the reality is like, if, if someone were to ask me that, like, I'm not even sure I would know how to answer that. That's the reality, like compared to what, compared to who. And so I think, to, to rate it on a scale of one to 10, if someone would pin me with that, I mean, I'd probably say a, a six or a seven and leave a gap and just say, you know, but I'm not really sure what it's compared to. So, but in terms of leading ourselves, I I would say I am not a, I'm laughing because anybody that knows me knows this. I'm just not a consistent person, like in terms of rhythms, yet I've learned that that is the superpower. And so by default, I'm a burst of energy like just work in waves and yeah. the reset button said every Monday, I forgot what last week was like, that's just, that's naturally how I'm wired. But I also know and have learned and believe that consistency on a personal level and also on a leadership level is the superpower. And so I can justify how I'm naturally wired and just say, that's how I'm going to keep operating. Or I can realize that I need to start to build consistency in terms of how I operate personally and then also Good. professionally and Good. someone that can do that on the consist- consistency side, they're, they're going to outperform the people around them. And they, it might be the burst of energy person might kind of be ahead here, but that consistent person, they're going to build and they're going to catch up. and they're gonna pass. I love what you said that leadership is a process, not an event. And yep. I don't think many people understand that, but when you said that, that hit me like a ton of bricks. Mm-hmm. You're right. You have, it's a choice every single day. My aunt yep. and her business partner talk about, we have the choice every single day to how do we respond to conflict with our wife? How do we respond yep. to conflict with the people at work? How do we respond to when it's happy, when it's sad? I get the control, Davis Hambrick. Nobody else does. And I can't say yep. that <laughs> Walker pissed me off. No, my anger yep. is what really pissed me off, right? And so we have the choice every single day to choose to be a leader, to continue to invest in ourselves so that we can serve other people. But if we don't view leadership as a process, like you said, it's, we're just going to view it as an event and we're going to have a spurts of energy and not be consistent. I love how that comes together. And so as we wind down, Eric, I always ask this question. If you were going to encourage someone to come into the construction industry, what are some qualities you think they should have? Yeah, I would say one would just be desire for continuous learning. There's, there's something new to learn every single day Hmm. Two, I would say what you you mentioned leadership, you know, it's such a broad thing, but the ability to, to lead, which I would define myself as the ability to create clarity and set direction Hmm. will set somebody apart. That definition, you can use all sorts of definitions, but the ability Hmm. to create clarity and set direction. If someone has that quality, they're going to go very far because oftentimes people don't have the ability or want to create clarity because it puts their reputation or themselves at risk. And the people that step out and do that are the ones that go further. Three, I got to give, I can't do even numbers. So there's going to have to be a three. That's fine. Uh, Yeah. I would say the third one, openness to change. Mm, Um, and And I think, you know, in some ways that goes hand in hand with learning, but you can learn a whole lot, but still kind of get stuck in the mud openness to change because things are and will continue to constantly change um, within an organization on a project on a job site uh, and then if you're moving from one company to the next you know just openness to change can be critical yeah yeah that, behavior, that's really good what are you saying just behavior change is the hardest thing we do it's, you know it's when it boils yeah. down to it our behaviors is how it's we are the only person that can change it right and being open to change man <laughs> that, that's habits. such a big thing what'd you say yep. I said atomic habits. We're reading, right. we read about it every two weeks, but no, you're completely yeah. right. And the openness to change is, is massive, right? Because in a project that's ever changing, I mean, literally, like you yeah. said, every day is different. 
yeah. if you're if you're stuck on what you did yesterday, you're not going to be successful today. And that's yeah. what's that's what's terrible and also great about construction is you don't know what your day is going to look like. And the same with business, right? You don't you don't know what your day is going to look like. If that's not for you, then there's plenty of jobs yeah. to do the same thing every day. <laughs> exactly. Right? But exactly. For those yep. who do like the change, who like the different things, then construction, yep. business, you name it, it's a fantastic place to be. Yep. Eric, like you said, you've done a lot. You've been through, you've owned companies, you you've helped people with companies, you've sold, you bought, you name it, right? Through all of this experience, what if you could go back in time, what would you tell your 20-year-old self? What would you want to know then? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll I'll caveat this through through all ups and downs good bad and indifferent i wouldn't i wouldn't change anything because everything then has made me who i am now but if i were to go back to that 20 year old self and tell them i would say the most critical part is really knowing who who you are knowing who i am and that when you talk about personal values you know i do believe in the mission statement. People kind of roll their eyes sometimes on the personal mission statement, but really knowing what you're about. For some people, that's a faith component. For me, it is. But knowing what you value and what's important to you and having that right, because that's going to guide everything else. Yeah, that's good. I love that. But, you know, I think about the stereotypical advice. Walker and I both heard it from our from our school that we went to in college, Auburn, when we ask about what should we do to be better at interviewing, they would always tell you, you know, be yourself. And I could not stand it. Not stand <laughs> it. But yeah. knowing who you are is different than being yourself. Knowing yeah. who you are is yeah. knowing your values, your mission statement. What are, what are yeah. you at the core? Being yourself is like, oh, all right, oh, yeah. that's easy. I can do that. But like, yeah. I mean, help me here, right? And so I love that point. That's so much different the qualities you hit on desire for continuous learning. If you have, if you're a sponge and choose to learn every single day in the industry, you're going to grow the ability to lead, not mm-hmm. just the ability to lead, but create clarity and set direction. Love that. That I mean, that's tremendous. I don't think I've ever heard that one. I love that definition of leadership and then openness to change. Like, man, I'm fired up. I was tired before we got on this phone call. <laughs> but now I'm excited. I'm ready to go. That's good. Yeah, there's a there's a book and it's not a I mean, it's it's a much lesser known book, newer author. His name's Tim Spiker, the only leader is worth following. And there are some some principles or some concepts that he has baked into there that really speak to that knowing knowing who you are and then the influence or impact that that's going to have on your ability to lead and lead well. Awesome. I'm trying to look that up. Yeah. yeah. Can you say with that one more time? The only leaders what? Yeah, the only leader is worth following. And Tim Spiker is the author. Awesome. Why some yep. leaders succeed, others fall, fail, and how the quality of our lives hangs in, in the balance. Cool. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I'd say it's a, it's a lesser known book, but it's funny, you know, short version when I, when I met him and we were kind of talking and I was, I was trying not to be a jerk. There's so much leadership garbage out there. And I basically said, yeah, I, I'm interested. I hadn't read the book yet. I'll read it. But just to be honest, yeah. like, you know, there's so much out there. What's different about yours? And he pointed me to a couple of chapters and he said, Hey, just read these two. And if it's not interesting, you know, don't read the rest. You don't have to try to appease me. And I read it and it was, it was a great, really great read from a leadership standpoint, personal leadership, as well as beyond. Eric, man, this was, this was awesome. I mean, honestly, I think this is incredibly, incredibly valuable, not just to those who are coming into any industry, but those who might want a job change or who want to know how to get better, who become better leaders. I think you touched a, a crazy amount of these topics that if anyone listens to, it's going to make themselves better for it. So thank you so much for coming on. This has been awesome. Yeah. And I appreciate the opportunity just to have the conversation with you guys. It's actually been a lot of fun. So thank you. Anything you want to plug before we leave? Yeah, just uh, just a shout out for everybody that we're working with right now as a starting point. I appreciate all the clients that we're working with and every opportunity that they actually give us. And Journey Alliance, so it's journey-alliance.com uh, is our website. We're actually getting ready to, to blow it up and start over. And then you can find me on LinkedIn, Eric Schultz with Journey Alliance as well. But anybody that wants to get hold of us, you know, drop in through the website or through LinkedIn is probably the easiest way to find us. Wait, y'all heard it. Reach out to Eric Schultz at Journey Alliance. 